Well, I want to welcome our satellites. We have groups that meet Colorado, a couple in Colorado. Colorado's kind of a big place uh, for Bible study. We're, we're really growing, not so much here, but in Colorado, we're growing. <laughs> no, we're, uh, we're all over our city, and that's really fun. Thank you for being with us. If you've got your book, which I hope you do, because we're going to be in it, on page 27, I think, is a page to take some notes from the talk, but on page nine is the scripture that we're going to be in if you want to turn to that. Yeah, it's page 27 is the notes page, and page nine is Genesis chapter three where we will be. We're traveling through the book of Genesis, and we are looking at um, the mess, because it's this question, you know, uh, how how is it that we have this world that's so beautiful, right? I mean, it's just beautiful. Oceans and mountains and um, people and babies and puppies and just beautiful things, right? And yet, it can be so messed up. And in the same vein, how is it that we can be, I mean, people are really remarkable. You're remarkable, right? That people are so remarkable. And, and, and I'm remarkable, and yet, so messed up. And theologians and biblical scholars would point to what shows up for the first time, um, sin. And we're gonna talk about that. Uh, But what what we wanna get to and how we're gonna talk about that requires a verse of scripture that is so important. And I left it out of your book. Oh my word, but that's okay, because I'm gonna have you write it in, okay? It's um, Genesis 2, 25, so you'll write it in right there at the end of chapter two and uh, the beginning of chapter three. I can't believe I left this out, truly. I think I had it, I took it out, put it back in, anyway. Um, and this is what you're gonna write, this is the verse. And I wanna I, I sit on it for a minute, it's just, it's, it's mind-blowing. And the man and his wife, okay, and the man and his wife were both naked and the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed and were not ashamed. And this this little line is so significant to what the author of Genesis is gonna lay out in Genesis three. He is purposely putting this line at the end there, and of course when he wrote the book he didn't have chapters, it was just flowed right in. And what's significant about this is that I don't think he's just saying they were naked and they had sex and they had fun, which maybe he's saying that too, but I think what he's wanting to get at because of where the narrative is gonna flow is that this nakedness was again, not just a naked like physically naked, but I think he's saying they were fully themselves. They were absolutely completely vulnerable. That's to be naked, right? We even use that kind of idea. I felt so naked, right? They were fully, completely themselves, absolutely vulnerable to one another, and there was no shame. We're going to talk about shame. Can you imagine a world, a life? Can you imagine relationships in which you get to show up completely, authentically yourself, and there's no shame. There's no shame. You get to the delight in who you are. And the person you're with is delighting in who you are and you're delighting in who they are, all that they are. You see, shame is what comes along with sin. And it's like Velcro, right? You know Velcro? You have to reach in to dig it off, right? It, it sticks, it's there, and you can't just brush it away. 
And we're gonna talk about sin, and we're gonna talk about shame, and how we get from sin to shame. Because sin is a really, really complex concept. Last week, um, if you were here, or if you weren't, what we talked about last week was we talked about this moment when what we now know to be and call sin entered the world, right? Um, in Genesis 2, God says to the man, hey, you can eat from 552 kabillion trees, but there's one I'd like you not to eat from. And they choose to eat from that. But here's the complexity of sin, and I was thinking about this, because really, I mean, you, literally you would, could spend an entire semester in seminary just studying this topic. And so how do I unpack for you this doctrine of sin? I'm not gonna be able to do it very well, but it's absolutely crucial to our understanding of who God is. Because if we don't understand sin and shame, we will never, ever be absolutely blown away by the love of Christ. Sin is incredibly complex. We think of it as disobedience to God, and it is that, right? God said, don't eat from the tree. They eat, and there is disobedience for the first time in hu human history, right? But it seems to me that it is more than that. That with sin isn't just disobedience, but with sin there is a severing of relationship. It's not just disobeying God, but it's disbelieving God. In Hebrews 11, it says, without faith, it is impossible to please God. Theologians and biblical scholars will talk about how in Genesis, what was happening in Genesis 3 was an unfaith. They were given an opportunity to show their faith in God, to please him, right? And in their disobedience, they weren't just disobeying, they were disbelieving. They were disbelieving that this command was good, that the giver of the command was good, right? That he was generous, that he was for them. And the consequence of sin seems to be more than just a severing of relationship, and it is, we talk about sin separating us from God, but I would suggest to you that sin isn't just a separating of relationship or a severing of relationship, it is a severing of our identity. It is a severing of who we are. It's not just against God. See, that's the thing, people think sin is always against God, and it is, but it's always against yourself too. And guess what? It's always against everyone around you. It is never just individualistic, right? But it is a severing of our very identity. That's in Genesis chapter four, if you flip the page, Genesis 4, 7, God is talking to Cain, and this is the first time we see the word sin actually show up in the scripture. And it's interesting because Cain has brought an offering to God that is unacceptable. And God is giving Cain an opportunity an invitation to repentance, an invitation to transformation, an invitation to change, and he says to him, you know, if you do well, it will be pleasing. And he says in Genesis 4, 7, if you do not do well, sin, this is the first time we see this word, if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door. The language is like a lion ready to pounce. This is what sin does. Sin is crouching, ready to pounce, ready to destroy you. But I love the way the ESV translates this. It says, if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door. Its desire, sin's desire, is contrary to you. Some translations say sin's desire is to control you, or really a literal is just sin's desire is for you, but you must rule over it. 
because sin is contrary to you. It's not what you were made for. It's not your identity. There is no other relationship that we have that is like our relationship with God, and I think sometimes that can be a little bit of a tripping point, if you will, because we're trying to understand our relationship with God and and we liken it to other relationships, which can be helpful, but it also can be unhelpful because, again, we have no relationship with anybody that is like this relationship that we have with God. Because God is not just the author of our existence, he's the author of our identity, right? God is the author of our how. How did we come about? God is the author of our why. Why are we here? God is the author of our who. Who are we? God is the author of our where. Where will we be born? Where will we live? He is the author of our when. When will we be? He is the author of all of these things. It's why when Jesus is rescuing us, when he rescues us from our sin, that rescue is deeper than forgiveness. Now, hear me, it is forgiveness, but oftentimes when I was working with high school students, most of all of my biblical understanding and theology is grounded in working with students because they ask the most honest of questions, right? And oftentimes I would have a, you know, 15-year-old ask a really smart question such as, if God is love, and if God loves us, why does Jesus have to die? Can't God just forgive us and get over it? I can, right? I mean, in their 15-year-old mind, it's easy for me. I can forgive and move on, right? Why can't God do that? Well, one of the reasons is because it's, it's bigger than that. When Christ lives the life we couldn't live, dies the death we couldn't die, is raised again to new life. His rescue of us is, it is forgiveness, but it's not just forgiveness. It's a, as the scripture would tell us, it's an unlocking, it's a setting free. When he takes the wrath of God upon himself rather than having it fall upon us, he is absorbing a punishment we could never imagine, a justice. Christ's rescue is a forgiving, but it's more than a forgiving. The scripture tells us it's a transformation. And why is it a transformation? Because at the very core of our sin, what has been destroyed is our very identity. That's why Jesus says when somebody comes to him, a a religious guy comes and kind of says, hey, how do I get into your kingdom? How do I know I could be with God forever? All those things, and what does Jesus say? He says something really Jesus-y, very cryptic, very whatever, and you're like, hmm. Um, He says you must be born again. You must be born again. Your identity needs to be transformed to its original purpose, meaning. You don't even know. See, this is the problem with sin. Sin is so utterly pervasive, it's, it creates chaos, and it even creates chaos in our minds and our ability to even think about who we are and who God is. And Jesus says, you gotta be born again. There has to be a rebirth in you but I'm getting ahead of myself. Back to Genesis. Genesis chapter three. We'll talk more. (laughs) Genesis three, we talked last week, we looked at that encounter with the um, serpent who is the agent of the devil, who tempts Eve and Adam, who's standing right there with her, uh, to eat of this fruit, to enter into this disobedience and to enter into this disbelieving of the goodness and the generosity and the kindness of God. And then it says this in verse seven, then the eyes of both were opened and they knew 
that they were naked. Isn't that interesting? Because they already knew they were naked. But something's different now about the nakedness. They knew they were naked and they had no shame. The narrator, narr, narr, narrator wanted us to know that, right? So now their eyes are opened and they knew they were naked. And something in this nakedness causes them to sew fig leaves together and they made for themselves loincloths, right? They start to cover up. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden. He'd been walking, he'd been there, right? And in the cool of the day, and the man and his wife hid themselves. Circle, hid themselves. They hid themselves. Suddenly, where just previously they're talking with God, they're having conversation with God. God is telling them why they're here, what they're made for. He's telling them, hey, and I'm gonna give you stuff to help you in your life and help you go along, and now, and rather than talking with God, they're hiding from God. Rather than relating to God, they're covering up from God, right? So they hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, underline this, where are you? Certainly he knows, but he asks the question. And he said, Adam says, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid. Underline that. I was afraid. Suddenly fear, for the first time in all of history, fear. I was afraid. Why? Because I was naked. Contrast. I was naked and unashamed. I'm naked and now I'm afraid and I hid myself. God said, who told you that you were naked? <laughs> Have you eaten of the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, it's awesome. <laughs> the woman, <laughs> and it all begins, here you go. <laughs> the woman, and then I love this, because it's not like he's just blaming the woman, he's actually blaming God, which we love to blame God, right? Um, the woman whom you, by the way, gave to be with me, she gave me the fruit of the tree, and I, just little old me, victim to all you, victim to her, oh, I have no choice, I'm just, <laughs> I couldn't help myself, I ate. Then the Lord said to the woman, what, it is, what is it that you have done? And I love this, the woman is like, the devil made me do it. Uh, <laughs> The woman said, the serpent deceived me. I'll blame him. And I ate, right? Always the victim. And so we see, we see the mess, right? We see the mess rolling into existence. We see shame. Suddenly, they're naked and they're not unashamed. They're naked and they're afraid, and as a result, their destructive strategies set into motion, covering up, right? Hiding, blame, and now sin wins. It's crouching at the door, and it pounced. Brene Brown says this, Shame is the most powerful master emotion. It's the fear that we're not good enough. We're afraid that our truth isn't enough, that what we have to offer isn't enough without the bells and the whistles, without the editing and the impressing, right? And then uh, Lewis Smedes, which really, if you're a Brene Brown fan, please become a Lewis Smedes fan. This is the biblical skeleton for our understanding of shame. I like Brene Brown. I would say, though we want to have a theological understanding, Lewis Smedes, this is, I, I feel like she kind of wrote off of his skeleton. I don't know that she's ever read Lewis, but she should. Um, but it's a book called Shame and Grace. And it's so good. Um, 
I'm going to read you a bit, and it is a bit, but it's important. We have, if you go to Christian Assembly, we have a class called Shame and Grace in our Thrive classes, and um, I would highly recommend reading the book, taking the class. Here's what Lewis says. He says, to begin with, shame is a very heavy feeling. It is a feeling that we do not measure up and maybe never will measure up to the sorts of persons we were meant to be. The feeling when we are conscious, the feeling that when we, when we are conscious of it gives us a vague disgust with ourselves, which in turn feels like a hunk of lead on our hearts. You ever feel like you got a big hunk of lead? I spent about five years with what I would just, I remember telling my friends, I feel like I have a hot brick on my chest. Almost everybody feels shame sometimes, like an invisible load that weighs our spirits down and crushes out our joy. It is a lingering sorrow. But it can also be an acute pain that stings you at the moment you are feeling best. One person described her shame to me as a knife cutting into the heart of me just when I'm feeling good about myself. You ever been there? Like, ah. But if shame is not always that, that sharp, it is always a heaviness, as if on a long journey we were always trudging uphill or plowing through a swamp. Shame can fall over you when a person stares at you after you've said something inane at a party. <laughs> you ever feel that? Like you said, and then it's like, just kidding. Um, <laughs> or when you think everyone is clucking at how skinny or how fat or how clumsy you are. It comes when no one else is looking at you but yourself. And what you see is a phony, a coward, a bore a failure, a dumbbell, a person whose nose is too big, whose legs are too bony, or a mother who is incompetent at mothering, and all in all, a poor dope with little hope of ever becoming an acceptable human being. The feeling of shame is about our very selves, not about some bad thing we did or said, but about what we are, identity. See, that's what sin does. It severs us from who we were really created to be. All of our purposes and dignity and glory that we were created in as image bearers of God. It tells us that we are unworthy, totally unworthy. It is not as if a few seams in the garment of ourselves need stitching. The whole fabric is frayed. We feel that we are unacceptable. And to feel that is a life-wearying heaviness. Shame-burdened people are the sort whom Jesus had in mind when he invited the weary and the heavy laden to trade their heaviness for his lightness. Right, I'll let you buy the book. You can one-click it in a minute, not right now. Um, so how do we get out of this mess? How do we get out of this mess that is shame, right? I think the answer is found in the questions. God asks two really important questions in this passage, right? How do we get out of this mess? God says, this to the man, right? Where are you? Adam and Eve have gone hiding. They've moved away from God. This is going to be the progression of people throughout the book of Genesis and really throughout the scripture. They keep moving away. They keep getting further. This is the history of humanity. This is the position that sin puts us in, to be separated from God, 
to be hiding from him. Ephesians chapter two, verse 12 says this, you were separated from Christ. This is the problem. You were separated from Christ, alienated, strangers to God's promise, having no hope without God in the world. This is the condition. But here's the good news. Here's the beauty if you would continue on in Ephesians 2. But here's the message of Jesus. Jesus clearly, multiple times, declares, I came. I came to seek and to save the people who are far from me. I came to seek and to save the lost. Remember that time? A group of, it's always the religious people. Notice in the scripture, Jesus is never hard on the sinner and the person. He's always hard on the religious person, right? Because they don't get him. And he's like, why don't you get me? Um, And so some religious leaders were really disgusted that Jesus is, as they put it, look at him. He receives sinners. And guess what? He even eats with them. It's like he goes to their wedding reception or something crazy, and they're sinners. Who would do that? And you know what Jesus does? Oh, well, let me tell you a story. Let me tell you why I'm like this. I'm gonna tell you three stories. Now, I'm only gonna mention the first two because I love it. Jesus says this, you know, here's what people are like. People are like lost sheep. And here's the reality, most lost sheep don't know they're lost. People don't know they're far from me. People don't even understand that there's a separation. And so what I do is I stand at the edge and I preach at them and I yell at them and I scream at them and I throw Bibles at them to get them to understand that they're lost people. No, he doesn't say that. He says people are like lost sheep. They wander off, they don't even know it. But here's what God is like. God is like a good shepherd. A good shepherd leaves the 99 sheep that are sticking around the pen and he goes after that one sheep. He goes after the sheep. He goes after that little lamb and he brings them back and we celebrate that. You know how, what else uh, people are like? People are like coins that have a ton of value to the owner. And they're super valuable to that owner. And you know what God's like? God is like the owner of the coin. And he so values that coin. Might not be valuable to other people, but to him, that quarter means a lot. And so you know what God does? He gets down on his hands and his knees and he searches until he finds those coins. And when he finds them, he celebrates. And he tells his neighbors, I found my coins, don't worry, they're awesome, I have them back in my possession. You see, this is Christianity. The God of Christianity, it's interesting, very subtle in Genesis 3. In the beginning, when the serpent is talking to Adam and Eve and to to Eve, the serpent calls God simply God, Elohim. It's a, a word used throughout scripture for God, and it typically references God as the creator God. And so we have this sense that that's the serpent doesn't really know God as a personal God, but knows God as a creator God, a big deist kind of God. And then when the narrator changes to God coming after them, he changes the name. He adds to the name, really. And so the serpent is saying, God Elohim, and the narrator changes to God Yahweh Elohim, the Lord God, and it combines that creator God, big, majestic, powerful God with the covenant God, Yahweh. He makes promises and he keeps them. 
He's with them. He's walking in the garden in the cool of the day. I might be reading uh, too much into this, so take this with a grain of salt, but it's interesting that that word there for God walking in the cool of the day could also be translated wind. And throughout the scripture, the Holy Spirit is oftentimes referred to as wind. God and his spirit is walking amongst them. And what does the Holy Spirit do? What does the wind do when it blows through the early church? It brings salvation. It brings the lost one back. It empowers the weary. It's the language that Jesus uses when he talks about being born again the spirit will go like the wind and we can't control him and he will do what he chooses to do and he will go where he chooses to go and he will transform you back to the identity you were created for. Where are you? This is the invitation. I love this little picture that Bill Hybels uses. Um, it's a ladder, and uh, he says, okay, so here's God, right? I don't know if you guys can see it in the back, but I'll try to, trust me. Uh, so here's God. Where are you? Where are you? Here's the serial killers. Okay. 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 And you go, okay, there's the serial, I'm not a serial killer, it might be here. Mother Teresa. She's, right, good old MT, she's up there. <laughs> Billy Graham, BG, he's there. Maybe I'm somewhere here, right? And so many of us are on this ladder and God is whispering, where are you? And you're thinking, well, I'm here and I'm gonna get to you, God. I'm trying, that's why I'm at Bible study. Look at me. And guess what? I, I'm, I'm, I, I'm gonna stop this and I'm gonna start that. But I'll tell you what. Mother Teresa and Billy Graham would tell you one thing. Getting to God was not their good works or their amazing preaching. They would say, what's the way up the ladder? The way up the ladder is the fact that you have a God who's come down the ladder, who's come to find you, to seek and to save the lost, to bring you back. How do I get up the ladder? This is the purpose of the cross, right? This is the message of Christianity. And God is saying to some of you, even this morning, where are you? Where are you? I love 1 Peter 3.18. says this, For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. Are you trying to get to God? Stop it. Let today be the day that he got you. Let the de today be the day where you no longer are trying to plow your way up a ladder, where you're letting the shame of not getting up the ladder destroy you, the shame of comparing where you think you are on this ladder. Christianity actually really has no space for a ladder because guess what? This beautiful thing that we have is we have a God who even comes after serial killers. There's enough grace. There's a deep enough love. Where are you? Would today be the day, like Mother Teresa, like Billy Graham, you would just say, I'm with God. Why? How? Because of Jesus. Where are you? With God. Why? How? Jesus. No other reason. 
no performance, no getting it better, no getting it right. Jesus, where are you? And then the last question, the other question that God asked that's so awesome, who told you you were naked? Whose voice are you listening to? We talked a little bit about this last week, but it's really an important question. Whose voice are you listening to? Are you listening to the voice of the serpent? Are you listening to the serpent who's telling you not to trust me? Who's telling you I'm a liar? Who's telling you I'm not good? Who's telling you I'm not generous? Are you listening to the voice of the world who's telling you there needs to be more, that you need to have more, that you need to be, you need to be more, you need to be less, you need to be whatever? Are you listening to the voice of the world? Are you listening to the tapes of your childhood? Whose voice are you listening to? Who told you that you were naked? Whose word, and this is your question, I want you to sit with this. Don't answer too quickly. Whose word defines you? Let me tell you how the word of Genesis defines you. It tells you you're an image bearer. You share and you carry the glory of God upon you and in you. Tells you that you have dignity, that you're a co-laborer with God, that you were made for a purpose, that you have value, that you have worth. The book of Genesis tells you that you were made by God, to be with God, for God. The New Testament says that as well. Uh, Let me tell you what the word of Ephesians chapter one says about you, how it defines you. It says this, it says you are blessed with every spiritual blessing in Christ. If you have received what God has done for you in Jesus and you have found that your, your way to him was actually him coming to you and you placed your faith and your trust in that, he says, You now, you are blessed with every spiritual blessing in Christ. Ephesians 1 says you are chosen in Christ before the creation of the world. Ephesians 1 says you are predestined for adoption to sonship, to belong to Jesus. You are lavished with love and with grace. You are included in Christ. You are marked in Christ with a seal when you believe. The seal is that blessed Holy Spirit who guarantees your inheritance. And if this last one is the only thing that Ephesians 1 said about you, said about me, it would be enough. You are God's possession. You're his. 1 John 4, 15 to 19 says this, and I'll end with this. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, that's what it means to become a Christian, simple as that. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him or her, and he or she in God. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God abides in him and he in God. So we have come to know and to believe that the love that God, believe the love that God has for us. God is love. Whoever abides in love abides in God and God abides in him. By this is, this is love perfected with us so that we may have confidence for the day of judgment. There is no Fear in love. God, I was afraid. And God's like, why are you afraid? It's me. And I'm love. I'm not just loving. I am love. Perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not been perfected in love. We love because God first loved us. Father, would this truth take deep root into who we are? Would you set us free? God, I pray for any woman here who needs to be set free by the truth of your grace and your love and your pursuit of them. Set them free this morning. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen.